everyone. I'm Chelsea with Greenlight Bookstore. I'll just be giving a quick intro as folks log in. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to host tonight's event with Tarek Shah presenting his new book, Whiteout Conditions. He'll be talking with Lee Clay Johnson, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Greenlight storefronts are currently closed and locked, but our community is still here. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. You can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you, um, but they can see your name over in our attendee list and when you uh, send messages in chat or the Q&A feature. Um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen here, you'll see a few different icons. Um, one of them is labeled chat. Uh, you can post messages in here throughout the event if you have any comments or if you just want to say hello to the authors. Uh, you'll also see down at the bottom of the Zoom window an icon labeled Q&A. That's where we'll be pulling questions from during the Q&A at the beginning of the, at the end of the event. So if you have any questions throughout the event or once we get to that portion, you can type them up right there. And we are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our website and social media channels later on. And books, the reason we're all here tonight. Uh, bookstores are closed for shopping, but the author's books are available for delivery to your home. You can go to greenlightbookstore.com, and for tonight, uh, this will still be featured on our homepage. You can just click on Tarek Space to find buying options. <laughs> <laughs> Our interviewer for this evening is Lee Clay Johnson. He is the author of the novel Nitro Mountain, which won the 2017 Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. His stories have appeared in Plowshares, Literary Hub, The Oxford American, The Common, Appalachian Heritage, Salamander, and the Mississippi Review. He holds a BA from Bennington College, an MFA from the University of Virginia, and was awarded a Walter E. Dakin Fellowship from the Swanee Writers Conference. He grew up around Nashville in a family of bluegrass musicians. You can see his guitars in the background now. <laughs> okay. And currently lives in Brooklyn where he serves as director of the Writers Foundry MFA program at St. Joseph's College. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Tarek Shaw. Born and raised in Illinois, he writes fiction and poetry and has work appearing or forthcoming in Jubilat, Heavy Feather Review, No Deer Magazine, Gravel, Blaze Vox, and other publications. From 2007 to 2009, he served as a Peace Corps volunteer, and he holds an MFA in creative writing from St. Joseph's College in Brooklyn, where he now teaches. His chat book, Heart Assist Device, was a finalist for the 2019 No Deer Small Anchor Press chat book series. His new book, Whiteout Conditions, Tarek combines poetic prose and witty dialogue in a moody, slow burn character study of childhood friends Ant and Vince, reuniting for the funeral of Vince's cousin Ray. Tarek is going to start us off with a brief reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with Lee and with all of you. Uh, Tarek, please take it away. Thanks very much. <clears throat> With the last of my loved ones now long dead, I find funerals kind of fun. Difficult to pinpoint what it is. I'm drawn to them. Call it an article of faith. They aren't what they used to be. And I am not my old self. I'm thinking of the deep boom and hush after the pastor shuts his thick tome of hymns and the heavy groans of the pews when everyone kneels. What comes to mind are the high school boneheads loafing around the holy water stoop, too rad to grieve, or who never learned how, never learned that it is learned, like formal dinner etiquette, a gallantry in the face of certain peril. It's the secret stoner altar boy glad to swing his censer. The blown apart family uniting for a minute to ridicule the reverend's lopsided toupee. 
the great uncle with trouble reading in the filmy pulpit daylight, his index finger trembling. Or when I drift off during an old man's eulogy, only to get clocked in the forehead with the truth for changing my vision of retired Honda dealers forever. At a certain point, the mileage accrued by hearts, like any muscle car, is just too fantastic. Once it was the apoplectic rage of a niece pacing the narthex, denied the chance to damn her uncle to hell, tell him she loved him. Sometimes it's the waterworks, other times the hearse. It was the pious haste with which Muslim grievers dug the grave buried the doctor, how that left everyone in a swarm, a bit head spun and forgetful the dead's dead. The wholehearted embraces given me by evangelists to whom I didn't speak at all, the fervent strangers touched on there, who cared I'd come, each hug verging on a submission hold. And it's this bright secret that won't quit tap dancing behind my benign expression that I keep from them that ensures their enthusiasm and sincerity are squandered on me. Or a jogger, sometimes there will be a jogger who will gawk like a rubbernecker or just keep jogging, maybe go a little faster. Seeing my buddies in suits for the first time, a grandmother passed remembering why she's there. Sometimes it's as simple as a song of tribute sung by someone who can't sing at all. You see people for who they are, and they don't mind being seen. And it's lovely in a way, that unabashed flawedness in the face of such heavy exposure, perhaps never to happen again. All of which would likely be overlooked, right choked up by the stiff in the coffin. It's everyone wondering what I am doing there. It's all the suspicious looks. Why aren't you sad like us? How they all ping right off me. Shadowing death. Handling death like a snake charmer, fishing cobras from his wicker basket. Wholly impervious to fang and by now safely immune to its venom. And how sometimes it's the other way around. Funerals are kind of fun. Yeah, I've cultivated a taste. It's become a kind of social pursuit. It was a kink of a kind. But now Ray, I see his face. The one in the photograph, the reporter in the field held up to the camera with its fresh acne and his right cheek's dimple deeper than I remember, and him already taller than his mother. And I'm having trouble sustaining a positive mental attitude. Now, a python's double-jointed jaws, death opens wide. But what do I know of such creatures? Thanks. Thank you, Tarek. Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, let me pull up some. Sure, man. Um, that's a powerful reading and it's from a manuscript I remember well. Um, I experienced this novel in a very early stage of its development. Um, for those out there <clears throat> who don't know, well, thank you for coming, first of all. It's um, despite the uh, disembodied, impersonal, <laughs> virtual thing, it is also the hyper-personal, right? We get to see Tarek's bedroom. <laughs> we also get to see my bedroom. <laughs> My old bedroom, I'm stuck in Tennessee. I was down here to clean up tornado stuff and got stuck here. Um, so here we are in our bedrooms um, looking at each other. It's cool. Anyways, for those out there 
who don't know, Tarek is a graduate um, of the MFA program at St. Joseph's College, uh, the Writers Foundry, right here, uh, right back there in Clinton Hill. Brooklyn, around here, yeah. Around here, uh, and it's uh, where I teach, and I served as Tarek's uh, thesis advisor for a thesis that was titled, Drum Roll, Whiteout, whiteout Conditions. Um, even back then, when I first read the first draft, I was struck by the qualities that, um, that are still present in it. Um, the, what we just heard you read, um, kind of every the DNA of the entire novel is set right there. Um, there's a strong sense um, of place, ironically, mixed with displacement. Um, it's a kind of post-suburban Midwestern wasteland. There is a, 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 brutal, a brutal lyricism to, um, to these grim circumstances that are kind of wrapped in humor and lovely language despite the, despite the, uh, the, the, the strange dark undertones and the tragic circumstances. Um, and um, there's also, and this is something I'm really fascinated by and um, with your writing, Tara, because this, your ability to inhabit, inhabit very complicated and problematic lost characters. Um, which brings me to my first question, which is what was growing up like for you, dude? <laughs> what are um, some, and that's not me trying to make a, uh, um, a, an immediate psychoanalysis, but I just, I'm interested in what uh, some of your early memories are. You are from uh, the Midwest, um, right. Illinois, and that's where most of this takes place. Were there any impressions that were left on you? Um, yeah, you know, yeah, so I grew up in a, in a town in northern Illinois um, called Lamont. Um, and uh, my, my upbringing was, um, I think, fairly conventional. Um, I was, you know, mid middle class kid, went to public school. Um, and uh, the big change in my life, I think, came up with the death of my father when I was 15. Um, and and dealing with that, um, I think, uh, informed a lot of this book, you know. Um, but um, growing up in, in that part of Illinois is interesting because it, I mean, it's not like a crazy wild place like you would think, like that you get when, you're, when you read like Southern writers, right? Um, at least for a long time, my, my impression was that it was very, fairly conventional. Um, but I think in undertaking this book, I was, and also like, you know, while studying under you, I came sort of for the first time to think of myself as an American writer. Um, and, and so I, in that tradition, I, you know, uh, trying to um, talk about where I came from and uh, and even if it is you know a weird kind of suburb or you know that is kind of sort of conventional um, making it specific and, and talking about um, you know the good and bad aspects of it if that makes sense that makes a lot of sense and something can you hear me yeah okay that makes a lot of sense and you did that and you captured it so successfully. Um, <clears throat> Thank there's you. Also, there's also something about the um, the suburban landscape that its repetition, its um, its kind of placelessness. You know, you know, it succeeds most when you just have no idea where you are. Right. Right. Um, and, the, and that is the uncanny um, and the, 
the familiar within the unfamiliar. And that is a presence that I found um, in the place of your novel and also the, the character's outlook on life. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, that place to me is almost defined by, by interstates, you know, and, and uh, highways and um, strip malls and parking lots and um, chain restaurants and, you know, things like that. Uh, and, and so it was, yeah, it was a balance between making sentences that were really like evocative or, or artistic or lyrical and not trying to sugarcoat it or make it something that it wasn't. Um, and so that was kind of a, an interesting challenge with this, with this story. That's great. You really did it. Um, there's a, um, a huge part of how you succeed in doing that is, as I mentioned earlier, um, wrapping these regular places in lyrical language. Um, could you talk about your influences about, um, well, uh, yeah, um, when it comes to like great sentences, um, or even sort of, um, writing about mundane things, uh, in, uh, an incredible way, I always go back to like Renata Adler in Speedboat, um, Joan Didion, um, you know, those writers, um, Amy Hempel, um, her language is um, just incredible and not because she's creating um, incredibly complicated uh, sentences or anything, but there's just some kind of a, a magic in, in finding the right word um, that um, pulls the reader along and also kind of does its regular job of describing the, the, the action or, or the, the subject or whatever it happens to be. There's a similarity um, here um, in the, with your writing and those others. Um, and that is, um, this is a fast, quick, uh, short novel, um, but what it lacks for in breadth and length it, re length, it makes up for in depth. Um, did you, can you talk about the, um, The, how you approached the writing of this? I mean, <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, how did you get started on on it? Um, I know that you wrote it insanely fast, and the the book moves like that as well. Can you talk about that? And um, were there any uh, expectations you had before you started it? Thank yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I totally. Um, so there are kind of two components to it um before i started writing um like the first sentence about you know i find funerals kind of fun was just part of a a, a paragraph that i had written in my notebook um and uh and i thought it was interesting but i was also working on another project at the time and so i kind of just uh let it be um and as i was working on my thesis over uh, the winter break of 2017, um, I was working on a completely different project and it wasn't, it wasn't happening. Um, and so I kind of was like looking through my notebook desperately for something that kind of caught fire. Um, and, and that sentence stuck out to me, um, uh, but it wasn't until I was hanging out with my, my niece um, and, and my, my brother's family's new dog and watching her kind of play roughly with this big, it was a big black, you know, Labrador, um, that the other component of the story kind of came in. Um, and then I decided to pursue that. Um, kind of like constructing the story, um, I kind of, I had like points I needed to hit you know, uh, so it was like a lot of listicles, like on post-it notes, you know, um, like this death, this one, this one, and then making sure, so 
the, the, the book is written in sort of like, you know, smallish vignettes. Um, and, and so I was trying to devote each little vignette um, to something that was really necessary for the story. Um, and, uh, and then just proceeded that way. Um, so I was doing all of that and I wanted to come away with something that was as complete as possible um, to kind of show like uh, that, that I could do that basically as a, a personal challenge with my MFA. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was just trying to keep everything that was essential um, and I wanted it to be a fast read. I wanted to kind of prove that I could get people to read a hundred pages, you know, like in a, a day or two. Um, and, uh, and so far, I think it was pretty successful, you know, so happy with it. I would say so. You've gotten some really great uh, support from, from BuzzFeed and Chicago Tribune listing it as a very, uh, a much anticipated novel. Um, yeah, I'm very thankful for that. I think that's really great. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in the, uh, your use of backstory in this brief novel. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to pull off the, the kind of backstory that you use here. Um, and it really gets at kind of some of the roots um, of these young men. Yeah. Um, who are in this book, they share similar qualities that might be quickly summed up as toxic. Um, why did you choose to give these particular guys the attention? Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I was interested in kind of creating constraints for myself. Um, so I, I'll, well, before I say that, I will say that I'm kind of interested in the, in the relationships between men, you know, um, and how they express themselves or, or don't express themselves, um, and, and how destructive that can be. Um, and, and so I wanted to kind of, um, display that. Um, and, you know, a lot of this stuff comes just from car rides I've been in with other people, you know, and, and um, not that, like, my friends aren't psychopaths or anything like that, but, um, you know, one thing that you have taught, it, or, or at least a bit of advice that you gave me was to, to find places to push chaos, um, and that really resonated with me, um, and it made you know, these two characters kind of come alive and it made writing it pretty fun and, and something that I would look forward to doing, uh, which is, I think, well, pretty responsible for why it was written so quickly. Um, you know, it was really, I was, uh, I was able to sympathize with both characters, um, despite how, um, how differently they, they handle their circumstances and, and everything. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just like, there's something about uh, the, these characters and, and coming back home from a long absence. Um, I was also influenced a little bit by the, the um, James Joyce um, short story in Dubliners um, about the, the newspaper man and who visits his friend in Dublin and how that um, kind of and results in its own kind of train wreck. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was a little bit of all of this stuff kind of just going on in my mind um, and uh, in trying to um, accurately um, portray the thing, the way things would have gone sometimes in, in this, in the circumstances of these characters. That's great. You certainly, um, from the very first sentence, light a fuse and just let it burn to its end. Um, Thank you, man. Thank you. There's um, there's kind of a trick to writing about chaos, and that is um, maintaining clarity. It's, you have to maintain clarity, especially when the characters are drunk or fucked up or um, yeah. whatever. You can't slip into that with them, right? There's a 
um, that be a mimetic fallacy, right? Right. I think the the reader know, has to know that even if that even if uh, even if we don't know where exactly we're going, we have to trust the driver. Um, yeah. To get us there, and we're going to get end up at a pretty interesting place. And the the uh, the ending that you where you leave us is is a riveting um, is a riveting place of brief glimpses of not uh, I don't know I don't know if redemption is too strong of a word, but I certainly felt that kind of kind of pulsing there in the life. Um, yeah, and that felt to me what is behind the uh, the narrator's um, vision and quest toward death, which is, it's actually, it's actually kind of purpose and meaning and even life that he's looking for because he hasn't found it anywhere else yet. So it's, um, it's a really moving journey that we go on. Um, Thank you very much. <clears throat> were there any moments that surprised you while writing this book? Um, yeah. <laughs> you just said shit i didn't know i wasn't expecting that sentence to jump out yeah um uh, i don't want to be too specific but like i mean i didn't know how it was really gonna end you know when i was writing it um i knew that like it was going to be about this character's um sort of like nihilistic take on life after all of this tragedy um and him uh, and his kind of equally nihilistic uh, uh, friend going to this funeral. Um, and, but the, the details and the circumstances and like the setting and all of that stuff um, really happened without much forethought, you know? I mean, like, I, I was like, okay, today I'm going to, we're gonna do the funeral scene and how does that happen and who is there um, and, and how do they get in and out, you know, and where do they go and why? Um, those questions um, kind of were answered on the fly. Um, obviously they were revised, you know, quite a bit, um, but that was a surprise. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of the surprise kind of happens towards the end of the of the novel um as i said i wasn't sure exactly how it was going to end or or who was going to you know come out on on top or whatever or you know if there was going to be anyone with any kind of heroic qualities or good qualities um you know the the uh the the the, uh, the thesis version that we worked on i think the uh the characters were much grayer you know um, and working with $2 radio, um, we, um, gave it a, the arc a little bit of a, a more, more of an arc basically, you know, um, and, uh, and I think that, um, strengthened the novel. Um, so yeah, um, it was kind of a catch as catch can situation. Um, I liked working, um, on it, you know, it kind of, uh, took over my life for a few months and, uh, and then, uh, when I, um got picked up uh it, it was fantastic feeling and and then we just kind of did it over again and opened it up a little bit more you realize you realize that by saying it um it took over your life for a few months you are the you're just the immediate enemy enemy of all all the other novelists out there i mean uh, <laughs> he's not i mean i'm my life has been taken over for years finishing this this second novel um yeah yeah you know fast, that's a fast process man so shame on, shame on you. Uh, well, you know, I, I really credit it to luck and just to like a, a really kind of um, serendipitous moment. You know, I have a bunch of short stories and, and poems that I'm working, it's like year two, you know? Um, so this one happened to just, it just happened to be clear to me. Um, and, but uh, I don't think, I think it's, it's uh, an exception definitely rather than the rule you know it takes hard work it's just like continuous um chipping away that's great yes it is a practice that we just have to go back to and it's also at points an act of faith that we have to that the practices will be of use somehow right yeah i think that's totally right yeah um there's some there's some really sharp dialogue um 
you have any rules for yourself when writing dialogue? Um, yeah. Um, there, I mean, there, there are sort of like mechanical things um, where like I, I try to, like if someone asks a question, um, the person that he's talking to, I, I try to have them actually respond to the question as infrequently as possible. Um, and, and just find out, instead of like just answering the question, giving like plot points or, or just direct information to the, uh, to the reader, um, to use those opportunities to, to deepen the character, um, to complicate things, um, to usually to make the, the situation as um, gripping or um, inextricable as possible. Um, but um, I don't have too many rules beyond that. I mean, I, I obviously want to um, sound um, natural, um, but um, as I learned from you, you know, the way we normally speak um, doesn't really work in fiction. You know, fiction is going to um, use different means to kind of reveal the truth about uh, about people and the way they speak. And, and so there's a kind of trick to that um, that, uh, that I try and, and keep in mind when I'm writing dialogue. Some of the successes of your dialogue are um, there's subtext and um, the characters are often kind of talking past each other a little bit and they both think they're the center of the universe and um, yeah, it, it makes for a, almost a kind of third dimension behind those two, two voices. Um, we yeah. can almost, just, but just by the way they speak to each other, we can almost see where they are. It's a fascinating uh, thing. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like, you know, the actual uh, subject is, is secondary to, um, to the way that they, these characters feel towards each other. And that's, what's really driving it. It's not, um, oh, you, you missed the turnoff. We have to go this other way. It's why are you never doing anything right? <laughs> you know, right. like that. So. Um, before we, um, before we get into some of these questions, I can see that we have some questions in the chat and also some questions in the Q and A. So we'll get to those. One last thing about the design of this book. Um, I mentioned um, earlier about the backstory, your use of backstory. Can you speak to um, your choice to insert that backstory and where you did it and um, what what influenced you to to bring in that that character so much of that character's history yeah um I, again it kind of comes back to that first sentence where he says you know with the last of my loved ones now long dead and so that is like that i feel like that has to be explained um and so as the story goes forwards he goes backwards and, and kind of checks off these boxes. Um, but in a way, it, those, um, that backstory is, is um, kind of meant to propel the, the tension as they go forward, you know? Um, and and it, it almost happens in like a real time where there's the, the, the character of Ant, the main character, um, and things happen in the present with him and Vince in the car that kind of trigger him to think about X, Y, or Z. Um, and, and, and so he is kind of caught in his own memories as he's um, heading up to Wisconsin a little bit. Um, so that was kind of informing that, that decision. Um, that's the best I could, could do that. I think, um, uh, a, a real lesson I was um, admiring and learning from and um, in this, in your use of backstories, yes, that it propels the forward momentum of the present narrative, which is a um, kind of what it should do, in my opinion, right? You don't want a story that's going to compete with the story. And yeah, I hadn't thought of that 
that the first sentence of this novel is so striking that it brings up questions that kind of need to be paid attention to a little bit. And so you do that later. And then, then when we return, we are, we have, um, we have all this, um, this momentum, this force behind us. So that's, yeah. really, that's really great. Um, Thanks, man. Thank you. Um, Two dollar radio seems like a really great place, and you mentioned their um, their edits um, in a kind of broader way. Can you say just a few more things before we turn start digging into the Q and A's about um, Two Dollar Radio and what it's been like working? Sure. With? Yeah, um, it's been it's been great. Mm -hmm. um, they have been um, extremely supportive um, uh, and very cool about like whether or not I took any of their edits. Um, I, I think I took like, you know, 99% of them, you know, um, cause you know, they're awesome. Um, but the, the, that those revisions, um, uh, focused largely on, um, filling in, um, a bit of backstory of the characters, um, and making sure that some minor characters that had existed um, had um, a little bit, made a little bit more sense um, or were a little bit more kind of fully realized. Um, and, um, and some of them were about, um, were addressing ways to kind of increase the tension and the momentum um, towards the latter, um, maybe third of the book. Um, and, and just kind of, um, deepening the characters um, and uh, and also like taking away things that felt redundant or kind of to telly, you know, um, and so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great experience working with them. I really, I feel really thankful. It's really awesome. Cool. Everybody make a note, $2 radio. <laughs> yeah, dude, they're great. Um, here's a, um, um, here's a question from Preetha. Hey, buddy. I know you. Um, quote, finding the right word. Could you please speak a little bit about your poetic practice and what sort of relationship does it have with your prose practice? Yeah, totally. Um, it's really weird. It's really kind of convoluted. Um, I Sometimes I'm doing both at once. Um, uh, in a general way, I will say, that um, I, I tend to switch off. So when I do like, I'll do like a short story or something. And, um, and by then I'm like sick of short stories. And so I find myself um, writing poetry. Um, and there's kind of two sides of the same coin, but I think that that does a disservice to both. They're both completely their own kind of domains. Um, and I think they kind of deserve uh, to be respected as such, um, but I don't know. I gain like I gain a weird sense of like power from like the poetic phrase, and that can inform a story in a big way. Um, but then a story, when you reduce it in your mind or or, or on the page to its essence, um, that will inspire um, a poem or something like that. So they, there's a push and pull there. Um, they're somehow related and that relationship kind of changes all the time. Um, and I think it's probably something that I'll always be like wondering about and trying to figure out. Um, and it's great that way. I love it. You know. One follow up of Preetha's here. Um, do you have a dialogue generator practice? Um, like, what do you physically and mentally do to get into the mouths of your characters? And I feel like what she's talking about is, you know, how do you inhabit different voices? Right. Um, well, it's really like, um, usually it'll start that I'm, I'm just remembering a voice that I, that I used to know. Um, I think that's a, a big engine towards um, my work um and 
it, it, and, and it, as such, it usually comes from a place of love. You know, like I miss that voice. I want to hear it. I'm appreciating it. Um, and then as the work develops, um, that gets pushed and pulled and tweaked and warped um, and until that original thing has become its own new thing. Uh, and then you kind of revise it. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's really kind of about um, appreciating uh, old voices from the past, um, you know, that I've, that I've remembered one day and I'm trying to um, rem like, you know, conjure them again in a way. That's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> there's something about the reading of literature, the teaching of literature, the writing of stories that is, um, there's a kind of, um, it's a practice of empathy in a way. And um, it's something that's very important. Um, so that's great. Um, you have people thanking you for your answer here. I see. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Yeah, it is. Um, um, Tom, Tom Grachowski, hello. Um, um. Yeah, um, he says, were there other works um, of homecoming, quote, homecoming fiction that influenced the book? You mentioned the Joyce story. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that there were. I, you know, earlier today, I was kind of jogging my brain about what I was... Um, doing when I was writing this book. Um, but the one thing that um, that definitely happened was that um, I couldn't read fiction for a while because I was, um, every time I tried to write something, I would be reading another book and be like, oh, this is so much better. This is really awesome. Um, and it was just like all this static, you know? Um, and so I, um, I, I stopped reading fiction. Um, for the duration of that time. Um, but no, I mean, I, you know, I'll probably remember um, the second this is over, but um, like homecoming, um, I couldn't say for sure. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> um. <laughs> This is a question from uh, Laura Spence Ash. And um, Laura says, I was interested that you chose to formally divide the book into two sections. What drove that decision and how do you think it affects the reading experience? Um, that's a good question too. Um, I, you know, very basically I was, as I was writing it, I, I thought, okay, this is, a weekend story, we'll do, you know, um, the first day, that'll be part one, and then the next one will be part two. And so it was a very kind of um, pragmatic decision um, that I thought would, that would be nicely wedded together by um, sort of a, um, an internal monologue um, at when the, uh, when Ant, the main character, is, is kind of like in this place of vulnerability and, and, and honesty with himself, um, that that would kind of be a, a pull, pull the reader through. Um, but that was really what was driving it. Um, and I kind of made that decision early on. Um, and, and then everything else kind of fell in place around it. I didn't think about it too much afterwards. Um. <clears throat> Here's one from anonymous attendee. So good. Uh -oh. How do you feel about the concept that you can only write about that which you know? And before you answer that, Tarek, I'm gonna just add that I personally, it's a, that's a tricky, that's a tricky question because I don't, I don't know what I know until, yeah. I start, until I start writing it. Yeah. And I can't remember who told me that, but I thought that's exactly right. Um, it feels right in many ways, but how, what's your take on that um, writing uh, about that, which you know? Um, I think, uh, well, in a certain sense, I guess that that can be true if you're like 
going to write about drag racing, you know, you don't know anything about it. But really, I think like stories um, aren't really about so much things as about, you know, emotions and, and situations um, that you've been in that are important uh, to you or, or something like that. Um, and so, like, if you're writing about heartbreak or something, um, and you don't know what, like, what that is about, that I mean, that might make it more difficult. Um, I don't like um, giving, uh, you know, absolute answers, you know, or generalizations, because I think uh, there are all kinds of exceptions to all these rules. Yeah. Um, I think you can you definitely tell a story through, like, um, uh, like a, a how-to type of story, um, you know, like how to um, uh, build a guitar or something like that. Um, and then through that, um, discuss other things. But, um, so that's a kind of a non-answer. Uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, that you should know um, about about um, the emotional states that you're that you're kind of dealing with, um, and regardless of of what sort of situation your characters are in, if, if that other thing is is solid, then you don't really need to know about uh, the nuts and bolts of whatever situation they're in. You can just kind of do whatever. That's because if you're doing the first thing right, I don't think that your readers will really care that much that you get the detail wrong about how to like, you know, change uh, a car tire, you know? Does that make sense? I'm listening. Um, this is one from uh, Sarah LaMotta. Um, thank you for the wonderful reading. I look forward to reading the book. I have heard that one of the themes of the book is toxic masculinity. I was wondering if you could talk about how you approached that subject and why you decided to tackle it. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I, um, I, I think this is, you know, a complicated, I guess it's a little bit complicated of an answer. Like the, um, so at heart, it's all about this, the relationship, the kind of destructive relationship between these two characters who um, uh, are sort of in these dead end ruts. Um, and I think, uh, <clears throat> I've seen it a lot, you know, like, like, the way um, guys act toward each other um, and, and how that can kind of um, manifest itself in, in dangerous and dark ways that are, and they hurt other people. Um, and the, I think the Midwest is full of that, you know? Uh, I think like there's a lot of that um, and it, and, uh, and so, you know, that that can't be ignored um and I, I guess i do feel a bit of a responsibility as you know a person from the midwest a heterosexual male um to to call that out you know um and uh so yeah i mean i i think it just it's just everywhere you know and uh and and so if i didn't maybe address that um I think it, the, the book wouldn't ring as true as it does. Yeah. Um, that's great. Sarah uh, says, thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, from Tommy Simmons, what up, Tarek? Oh, Tommy, <laughs> old friend from the Peace Corps. Cool. He said, uh, Tommy says, I was wondering if you saw yourself in either and or Vince, um, and if so, which character you related to more? Um, that's a good question. Um, I see myself in all of the characters, you know, I think they all, they all came from me. Um, and um, yeah, they're, 
both of them in a way. Um, I see, you know, myself, my brothers, my friends. Um, it's all kind of part of that. Um, and uh, and so I, it's definitely none of those those characters aren't like none of the characters in the book, I should say, are like um, this is this one guy, you know, um, it's all kind of a mishmash of, of things that I've kind of cherry picked um, in order to make the, the thing work. Um, here's a here's a question that deals with music and it's from Isabel um, and um, says hi Tarek there is um, there's this numbness and all the uncomfortable silences throughout the novel and still I in some parts of it I read I'm sorry I read as song lyrics maybe it's because there are so many great bands in the Midwest singing about roads heartbreak and death um, or maybe I'm just curious, did you listen to a specific type of music while writing the novel or thought about the plot in relation to a particular soundtrack? Congratulations on your brilliant book. That's a wonderful question. Is there a soundtrack to this, is, to this book? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much for that question. That is a really cool question. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I was listening to a lot of um, really heavy, music uh i was trying to find like you know the, the most provocative kind of music um that i could uh and so i mean i when i'm actually writing the thing i really i really like just like quiet um but like when i'm not writing it i'm like walking around you know i have music constantly like playing so like a lot of you know drone metal bands doom metal bands like sludge and um uh, and noise bands um there's a really good band from detroit called wolf eyes i listen to them a lot um, um out west um i think either seattle or portland um this band called sun i listen to them a lot um the jesus lizard you know um other bands you know like heavy bands um that um i think that that just kind of conjure up the belief landscape of chicago um and, and you know like driving in a shitty car <laughs> you know for hours um and and also kind of uh, the stuff that maybe these characters would listen to um and and uh and sort of zone out to um and uh, so yeah those those kinds of bands i listen to the music Yep. Cool. Um, I feel like a lot of those bands um, that you're mentioning definitely have um, a sound that is, you know, um, kind of made of, um, you know, heavy metallic materials, industrial, yeah. um, smoky, bleak settings. And that's, that's the tone of this, this book for sure. Thank you. Yeah, you know, like when I think of Chicago in winter, you know, all I think of are just like, you know, the highway guardrails that are just like caked with grimy snow, you know, um, and all of that. And it gets on everything. And, you know, there are definitely um, beautiful parts of Illinois um, and everything. Uh, but, and, and there are, you know, a thousand upsides to life in Chicagoland. Um, but, as far as this book is concerned and these characters, yeah, that metallic sound, that grating kind of, um, yeah, that'll give you, you know, nosebleed kind of sound um, were things that I was looking for. Um, this is a question from Monica Labadia. Um, hey Monica! <laughs> What has it been like releasing a book amid the quarantine virus? Um, has it affected anything aside from giving talks on Zoom like tonight? Good, <laughs> good question. I don't know if y'all heard it, but I'm I'm stuck at my I'm stuck in Tennessee, in my parents' house, and it's a real small house. And my dad is a banjo player, and he was giving banjo lessons. I don't know if you could hear banjo coming out, but it's like. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is certainly coming straight from Middle Tennessee right now. Uh, <laughs> so that's what it. What, but what has the uh, what has it been like? Um, this is certainly not what you expected your book release to be. Um, like. Right. No. Yeah. It's weird. Um, uh, I'm I'm still very thankful to be be given the opportunity to do um, events like these. Um, but you know, I think. I mean, yeah, it's weird. Everything is weird right now, you know? Uh, like, I think our re entire relationship to the outside world has changed. You know, it happened like super quick. Um, so, yeah, it's weird. Um, it, it could be a lot worse, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that, uh, you know, I'm healthy and, and still able to do this stuff. Um, <clears throat> in terms of work, it, like it's, uh, it's a little bit harder. My roommate as well is a uh, musician in a band. And, and so, um, you know, it, it, it yeah, it, it's a different, um, but it's, you know, it's, there's a learning curve and we're all learning it. So we'll be fine, you know, hopefully. Well, thank you. Thank you for that promise, Tarek. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, Preetha says more banjo. I guess that's on my daddy. Um, there were instances, this is coming from uh, Dan Blondell, Daniel Blondell, right on. Hey, man. There were instances, Dan writes, of withheld information um, from other characters or the reader. This is a fascinating aspect um, in this book and also in so many, so much fiction of withheld information. Um, yeah. That um, and he uh, he says it always felt deliberate and sometimes aggressive. It seems to heighten suspense and also suspicion of ant. Um, yeah, does it have other purposes? With holding information, um, no. I mean, it's mainly a function of uh, of the reality of the situation that characters are in, like. This, because the story is in you know first person present, um, there are simply things that uh, that Ant is not going to know. Um, for example, you know like like Batneck, like what his real name is, you know, or who he is. Um, and, and so I was a I, I wasn't aggressively trying to like you know throw the reader in any way, um, but these are the kinds of limitations that are would just be matter of fact for the situation real um and i so i i, I want to explain uh, as much as i can as artfully as i can but i also do like those moments of withheld information where the word stop but the reader's mind continues to go and and, and so i think that's a way of increasing the involvement of the reader in that exchange of uh, uh of information Thank you. Um, uh, here's one from our our great friend uh, um, Rob. Uh, when you start writing, do you know how it's going to end, do you, or do you arrive there page by page? That is in line with an earlier question of were yeah. you surprised? Um, right. So, do you know where you're going um, and how it's going to end? The word end there is is, is uh, um, important. Yeah, no, I don't really know how it's going to end. Although I do usually have like some kind of light at the end of the tunnel that's guiding me, whether it's like a tone that I'm maybe, I, I, I would want to end it on. Um, but oftentimes, no, uh, I don't know how it ends. Um, Usually what happens is I'll, I'll come to an ending um, and then, you, you know, there's that first draft and that's really the only time, like the first time that you can see the thing for what it is. Um, and so then there'll be subsequent endings um, and, that, and that's more of a revision process. Um, as long as I can get to an ending, um, that first draft, then I'm pretty happy, you know, I'm <laughs> thankful. So usually I don't know how it ends. Mm. That's wonderful. An ending is always welcome. And think, speaking of endings, Tarek. Oh, is it time? 
look at that old clock ticking ticking away um <clears throat> what an amazing uh conversation it has been we are going until 7 30 right are we going what was that no yeah i think 8 30 well 7 30 your time yeah oh yeah 8 30 okay right, right hey chelsea um Hi. so but um you know such an important thing to be connecting with each other and to everyone that came out for this. Um, you know, despite how we can feel sometimes during such unsettling, unbelievable times, I, I believe that literature and um, writing excel ultimately in times like this. And um, they're built to last and help us endure and even maybe have some fun. Um, I um, agree, man. In a thrill. So, um, Thank you to you, Tarek, and um, an alum of our writing community, to the current students that are hanging out there and the, uh, the virtual world, to some of our prospective and incoming students who are talking. Um, when, uh, when they all let us out of our cages, let's meet up on the street corner and raise hell. Yeah, it sounds great. Cool. Um, Lee, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. And to everyone that has um, participated or watched, thank you very much. Um, you are the best and I couldn't do any of this without you. Um, and also thank you, uh, Chelsea and Greenlight Books for um, helping host this and, and St. Joseph's College as well. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. Yeah, thank you so much, Tarek and Lee for this wonderful conversation. And again, thank you to everyone who showed up tonight. A reminder that you can buy Tarek's book, Whiteout Conditions, at greenlightbookstore.com. And this recording will be posted on the website and other social channels later if you missed any part of it. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.